From Bowling Green State University and the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society, this is BG Ideas. I'm going to show you this with a wonderful experiment. You're listening to the Big Ideas Podcast, a collaboration between the Institute for the Study of Culture and Society and the School of Media and Communication at Bowling Green State University. I'm Jolie Sheffer, Professor of English and American Culture Studies and the Director of ICS. As always, the opinions expressed on this podcast are those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of BGSU or its employees. Bowling Green State University and its campuses are situated in the Great Black Swamp and the Lower Great Lakes region. This land is the homeland of the Wyandotte, Kickapoo, Miami, Potawatomi, Ottawa, and multiple other indigenous tribal nations, present and past, who were forcibly removed to and from the area. We recognize these historical and contemporary ties and our efforts toward decolonizing history, and we thank the indigenous individuals and communities who've been living and working on this land from time immemorial. Today's episode, we examine graphic design and the role it can play in underserved and marginalized communities. Joining me in the studio are Sadie Redwing and Andrea Cardinal. Sadie is a Lakota graphic designer and an assistant professor at Ontario College of Art and Design University, OCAD. Her work focuses on maintaining the visual language for sovereign nations. Andrea Cardinal is an assistant professor in the graphic design department at BGSU, as well as the co-director of Talking Dolls Studio in Detroit. Andrea and Sadie, welcome. Thanks for joining me in Big Ideas. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having us. I'd like to sort of go backwards and to talk a bit about, for each of you, what led to your interest in graphic design, particularly as a tool for activism and advocacy. And both of you are also professors, so if you want to roll in pedagogy, feel free, but you can sort of tell the story as you want to. For you, was there a particular aha moment or formative experience that kind of led to your current positions? Sadie, will you kick us off? Yeah, so I want to say that being a 90s baby has strong influence in wanting or just being exposed to graphic design or media and so forth. So I grew up while watching a lot of MTV, a lot of strong hip-hop influence. I lived in a community and had a lot of friends that were inspiring creatives. So musicians had friends that were want to be rappers. They might need a flyer or an album cover and thinking about CD days and, uh, and didn't really think of that as graphic design I knew just like that creative aspect like going into a record store kind of just seeing admiring album art think about 90s you think of like Nickelodeon a lot of bright colors X Games was really big so you got to see like just a lot of adornment on snowboards skateboards stickers water bottles and everything just looked fun so when it came to I really would like to have a Native American imagery sticker on my water bottle. Where could I get it? So I, I think the wheels really started to turn as I progressed and really think about, man, I really have a lot of pride in my culture, but I don't see a lot of that pride in maybe more mainstream uh, media, pop culture type of thing. So in looking for a uh, place to go for education aspects, went to the Institute of American Indian Arts. They have a strong new media arts program. And there I had a, was exposed to many artists and creatives who were merging pop culture with traditional indigenous culture within the area. And it's just so cool. And it just revamped a, a whole appreciation for a culture that is has been looked at as maybe a little bit more craft-like, a little bit more, I want to say, hippie, or just never was essentially cool. So to kind of express that and share that, I think it just drived a new appreciation of youth wanting to learn more about cultural aspects. And I think as kind of putting those puzzle pieces together, it made a little bit more sense to go into education, but just kind of bring like a, a new flavor to appreciating indigenous art. Now, again, like I didn't expect myself to be in a teaching role, but just kind of bringing all the joys that I had within like my childhood growing up into the 90s and knowing what I like. And we live in such a media, like just feel the imagery all over the place and and that exposure to other creativity and kind of seeing culture immersed in those aspects. It's just really nice to bring some of those elements into a classroom and then engage the students of their interests and capture them and allow them to have confidence and in what they like and also have pride in a culture they might be identifying with. Mm. Andrea, what about for you? What was your evolution into kind of graphic design and kind of advocacy? Yeah, it's very similar to Sadie's, but just from a different subculture, but a related subculture in that I grew up listening to metal and punk rock with my mom and my sister and then started going to shows at like a DIY community space in Flint 
um, in Michigan. And and then also um, skateboarding culture. And so in these subcultures, you see a lot of symbols. And so I'm a child of the 80s, going to these spaces in the 90s. So this predates my access to the internet. And so you have to have an insider knowledge to know what that symbol meant. I would see all these like punk rock symbols and be like, oh, I got to figure out what that is. And, and you couldn't just go look it up. I couldn't go Google it. You had to make friends. You had to ask somebody. You had to find the record at the record store. You had to kind of stumble upon this culture. And I, I love the idea of this kind of hidden knowledge or secret knowledge that symbols provide to us. And I became really enamored of those things. And then, you know, what really kind of helped me to think about moving into education specifically because of undergrad and because of my grad school experiences, I felt like my experiences as a kiddo coming from a working poor background from these subcultures just was not represented in the faculty that I was working with. And I also felt like there was this kind of stereotype of like the angry white man who was, was teaching me in all of these courses. And I just thought, there's so much that I want to undo with my kiddo, with my students, and building a culture that is based around care and vulnerability and risk in my classes that I just didn't feel like I got to experience uh, as a student. Can you give some examples um, from your own work of the way graphic design has this unique capability as a visual medium to motivate, educate, or inspire? So, Sadie, can you sort of talk us through, I know we're, we're listening, so we can't see it, but sort of talk us through an example of the kind of work that really represents kind of your perspective on what graphic design can do. Right. So I think if someone were to Google some of my work or maybe hear a lecture, recording presentation or attend a workshop, a large amount of my work really reflects historical knowledge. So being within the realm of graphic design, I never envisioned myself to be a historian in some aspects. But in order to understand visual languages of tribal nations, and if we live in a time where there isn't that competency you really have to paint the picture or just kind of remind folks of history or just longevity of time. And usually to comprehend some of these visual languages, we see a lot of use within symbols, shapes, squares. You'll see it in my work that reflects beadwork, uh, parfletch work, which is leather work painted with uh, handmade paints and dyes, a uh, quill work, porcupine quill. So a lot of natural elements traditionally we use to make particular items. Now, when we work in a space in, let's say, 2022, now we're working with an Adobe. So how can we bring in some of these visual elements that you might see from a tangible piece made in like the 1400s and still maintain and preserve some of those practices, but maybe within a digital space? So to give a little bit of clarification, so beadwork, in order to understand or even see beadwork, you might take an American history class, art history class, sorry, or even visit a museum or maybe documents or photographs taken from like the 1800s, but not may not necessarily be in your hands to be able to feel it. So you might miss the context of uh, where some of these symbols might originate or maybe why they might look like a little bit of 8-bit eight, eight <laughs> character like from an old Nintendo game or whatnot, but understanding that that uh, practice of of weaving or stringing particular beads or shells together, it brings a, a unique aesthetic. And you see that with porcupine quills. We have a lot of jewelry that if you flatten a porcupine quill, uh, and you can't really do much other than maybe like twist it or it's it's not like a, a brush where you can have a really fine stroke. You're going to have a little bit more line work, a little bit uh, right angle, uh, 60 degree angle work. So if you look at some of my work, you see a lot of pattern or symbolic elements. And part of that is preservation and just to kind of uh, share historical practices in a digital format. Now, when I mention that, in order to teach uh, an aesthetic like that, it, you do have to kind of explain where some of these materials come from. So if you're taking a class, where, uh, you're taking a graphic design class of mine, we're talking about the porcupine, like somebody may, may like not make the connection until they start to really see, oh, I understand that your tribe or your culture or within your identity because you didn't speak English or because you didn't have uh, books or you know the printing press or library you had to document what the symbol is semiotics so really introducing these concepts of why did that symbol 
or why did that symbol help provide an oral history of, let's say, land preservation, uh, something like buffalo mating, or just where do you go find porcupine quills, or just some some elements, the importance of a symbol, because we didn't have books. And I think some people forget that sometimes. So really, in order for me to kind of teach a, a graphic design class with the focus of indigenous perspective, there has to be understanding of what, why, what life was like pre-colonization. So uh, trying to be contemporary in the arts, but also uh, preserve history at the same time. Andrea, what about for you? Can you give us an example from your own work of the way you have used graphic design to sort of as a kind of pedagogical tool, right? Like for an audience to motivate, educate, inspire, move people to some kind of action. Yeah, I mean, that that is the definition that I'm always trying to give to our students. It's like the, we, we can make pretty things. You have that capability. You know, by the time you're a junior, you have some facility with software to other tools. But from that point on, we're really talking about ultimately the goal is to move people to, to toward change. We ultimately want to be working towards justice. And so we're concentrating a bit more on, on thinking about different forms of oppression that exist in our communities. And for me, my probably most recent body of work, the last maybe 10 years, maybe five years, uh, has been around direct action specifically. And that has shifted a bit, of course, because of the pandemic. But, you know, a few years ago, I just decided to start to build these oversized banners for our studio. We have a banner lending library, which was an, an idea that was um, brought to us by a friend and collaborator, Elle Weaver. And I thought, I can do that. I can help make banners. I can help make these oversized banners. That's well within my, you know, skill range. And so I started creating these events where people would come to the studio or I would host them at other spaces where we would create these big oversized banners, anywhere from four to eight feet. The largest ones I've made are four, uh, four foot by 10 foot. And then we would also just pull screen prints of posters. And we um, started building these events around labor. I mean, we were producing ephemera and, and sometimes hundreds of pieces of ephemera in a short period of time. But we're also talking. We're also eating. We're listening to music. We are communing through this labor that's being built. And um, it's through designing those experiences. I really see that as my artwork. It's through designing those experiences that ultimately, yes, we go and we use those banners at Direct Actions. But the very first banner workshop that I held, we created these four banners with uh, the Asada Shakur quote, the kind of four stanzas of it. And then we took those banners to a 50-50 rally that was happening in Detroit, commemorating the uprisings from 1967 in Detroit and then also conflict in Palestine. And we just sort of laid them out in the grass and immediately people picked them up. They held them up. They posed with them for photos. Children were doing it. Our elders were doing it. it. It's like there was this immediate draw to just these sheets that had some letters painted on them. Just watching the way that people responded to the, that work, I thought, there's so much power here with such a little bit of effort needed. And then the, the communing that happened in the creation of that and of those things, it just affirmed for me. And that's what I want to try to translate to my students. You know, we have these skills. There are needs that need to be met. Whether you're working in a direct action sense or, you're, or you are building beautiful things for people to look at, there is this way to build community around it, support that community, and build justice. We're going to take a quick break. Thanks for listening to the Big Ideas podcast. If you are passionate about Big Ideas, consider sponsoring this program. To have your name or organization mentioned here, please contact us at ics at bgsu.edu. Hello, welcome back to the Big Ideas podcast. Today, I'm talking to Sadie Redwing and Andrea Cardinal about how graphic design can be used as a form of protest and improvement for communities. Sadie, your work focuses a lot, as you've been talking about, on kind of representing history and c contemporary indigenous experience. Could you talk a bit about like the way you think about the term sovereignty and how that is a part of your work? Yeah, absolutely. So 
I would say, and this falls right into talking about direct action and being active and wanting to have a voice, particularly if you come from a very small community or a small sovereign nation or a small little country within the United States. And sometimes you just feel like you're invisible or you're not heard, particularly around as we get into we're running into issues around like climate change or global warming when there's a lot of knowledge out there that can be shared nationwide to really help some of these things. So I think what really kind of allowed me to step foot in the research around visual sovereignty is really bringing identity to Lakota tribes within South Dakota and North Dakota. So in 2016, the fight against the Dakota Access Pipeline, which is bringing oil through some of the reservations of the sovereign nations, which had potentially would contaminate freshwater cleaning supplies. And if you come from, if you can imagine South Dakota, North Dakota, very rural, not as populous as, let's say, the east or west coast, uh, it's a little bit harder to get your way in some sense when maybe you have a um, more of a larger force, particularly the U.S. government wanting to bring in a project that is going to be devastated to your tribe's population. So in means of combating that, one thing that was so beautiful about the fight at Standing Rock is it brought people together. It brought artists and the importance of being a visual communicator. Now, in areas like that sometimes, particularly when working with a demographic, if more non-Indigenous designers are participating in that aspect, they might mistakenly or even too, they might use stereotypes. So if you're seeing mass stereotypes that are representing, let's say, a tribal nation, it doesn't give identity to the country, the nation of Standing Rock. What has allowed me to share voice in this, con in this concept of sovereignty is why are we relying on, let's say, buffaloes, medicine wheels, headdresses in a movement like this when really we should be amplifying the voice of Standing Rock? What, how does Standing Rock uh, write? What is their language? Why aren't we seen as a nation? Who or how? What can a graphic designer do to push to recognition? So it kind of really, really push these doors, or open these doors and push this thinking of, man, we live in the United States and the United States doesn't recognize all these neighboring little mini countries inside of it. Why? Is it because we don't visually see it? And then even opens and starts to ask, like, how do we know other international aspects of, of countries, little countries at the same size as some of these reservations or these sovereign nations? And we recognize them globally. Do we recognize them because we see them in the Olympics? How much graphic design goes in with the Olympics? FIFA World Cup is coming up. How much graphic design goes into FIFA World Cup showing nationality? So visually community uh, nationality, which would be defined visual sovereignty. And I feel like to this day, we just don't have enough visual sovereignty of tribal nations in the United States and Canada yet. But many opportunities for graphic designers to bring those to light. The Banner Lending Library Project in Detroit my work was directly inspired by the work that I was seeing happening at Standing Rock and other environmental justice actions where there were these giant oversized banners being made. And I thought, oh, I can figure that out. I can figure out how to do that. And ultimately, in support of other water rights issues that were happening, of course, in Flint, Michigan, my hometown, in Detroit, Michigan, we have huge human rights violations with regard to water. And then also, I live in Toledo, and a few years ago, we had a huge issue with microcystin toxin in Lake Erie, and our, our water supply was undrinkable for about a week. I, at that time, I had two babies in cloth diapers, and we could not touch our water. And so we were so inspired by the actions, the direct action, the art making, the communing that was happening in that fight against injustice of an invasion of a sovereign nation within the United States was important for us to be able to see and learn from. For me, you know, years ago, I just stopped feeling like I could make pretty things. I, I just wanted to be very direct. And and literally, it it is that like just painting letters on sheets. It is like I just want to be as, as direct as possible. And sometimes that involves like color palettes. It, it might go as far as color palettes. So, you know, certain actions, we have conversations with, um, usually I'm working with a communications team, that that team is deciding what the language will be that will go on these pieces of ephemera. And they're much more skilled at thinking about that. And, and then I'm much more skilled at sort of facilitating the actual production of, of pieces. But I'm thinking more about 
how does something read sort of logistically from a distance? How can we how can we communicate? And that's what those those giant banners specifically at Standing Rock were so powerful. It's like you can read that from a drone. You can read that from, you know, somebody of a, a photographer shooting that from, you know, yards away. And so I was I, I think I've just been thinking more about how can I be as straightforward as possible with I mean maybe I'm choosing fonts and, and color palettes, but other than that it's just trying to create impact through quantity and directness. Can you talk a little bit about your work with talking dolls and how kind of creating alternative spaces is an important element of uh, the work that you're talking about. Yeah, I mean, my work now is sort of transitioning into these ideas of beloved community spaces. Beloved community is my, is the work that was started by uh, a 15th century theologian, but then brought to the forefront by Dr. Martin Luther King, and then extended by the work of Grace Lee and Jimmy Boggs in Detroit. And so it's really from learning from them. I'm a student of their work. And thinking about how we can create spaces that are transformative, not through what we are protesting against. It is that. That is a component. But what are we protesting for? Ultimately, what are we trying to build? And we have to build it. (laughs) With the very little energy that I have living with uh, chronic illness and disability. And so I'm more focused in thinking about for sure, anti-racism, racial equity, and disability justice. And so my work is transitioning into that. How do we start to, as a designer, I'm making less and less ephemera. Like I still will make a poster. I still will make an identity. I still do, you know, capital G, capital D, graphic design, freelance on the side every once in a while. But my work is really about designing experiences. And those experiences are as straightforward as buying some food, getting some music, putting some art supplies out, let's make a thing, or you can make whatever you want. I usually have stations where there are pre-burned screens that can be pulled, similar to what Sadie was talking about, or open screens where you can cut uh, stencils out yourself and just pull a, a handful of, of, of posters of something that you just created just then. So yeah, my work is really about just designing those experiences, designing those workshops, and it is about skill sharing. I'm trying to get folks to see like, you could buy a couple screens for 30 bucks a piece. You can buy some ink for, you know, 30 bucks and you can pull literally hundreds of pieces of ephemera within a short period of time. Now you can take those skills back to your communities and you can hold these communal workshops together to support whatever action needs to happen in your particular community at Talking Dolls. That's sort of my niche. As a studio, we we have a space that then people can come and perform these types of workshops. Experimental art is created there. And then also just gathering just as just a base, you know, within our neighborhood in North um, East Detroit. And there's not any expectation of buying something. There's not any expectation of you have to look or act or be a certain way. You know, it is just a uh, real safe. Yeah. Part of what I want to underscore that both of you are getting at is that graphic design is never effective in isolation, right? It is part of a a broader coalition, right? That it requires deep research, thinking about language and history, community, right? And those relationships. And, you know, as a plug for ICS, right? These are things that we're really interested in that I think so often the conversations we tend to have around things are sort of in isolation. And both of you are really getting at that the work itself is communal and that you it is most effective when it's really building on a lot of people's expertise yes, and creating yes. something that lives beyond yes. the immediate moment. I think historically design has been seen as a handmade into capitalism. It has been called that because it's traditionally seen within the art world specifically as you must have a client. There has to be a client designer relationship. And it really hasn't been that for my entire lifetime. So it has opened up. And I want to shout out the Design Justice Network here because the Design Justice Network was founded in Detroit, is a worldwide movement now that is specifically stating one of the, there are 10 main principles that guide. And one of the principles is that we see ourselves as facilitators rather than experts. We are one, we represent one skill set, or, you know, we have a skill set as designers, but we represent one piece. And when you're doing socially engaged work, you are not the expert in the room. You are, you are there to listen and you are there to ensure that the needs that that community is identifying for you are being met through those skills that you have. 
So I don't know, so much of what I'm trying to do as an educator and as a designer is slowing things down a bit, helping folks to be able to recognize their own biases, and then utilize your skills as a facilitator in order to initiate and then also make actual change happen, right? And that's really the the goal within the, the Design Justice Network, too. And design is powerful. And I think as an educator, you got to be you got to remind that to the students, too, is that you don't realize how powerful you are as a designer. You don't want to abuse that power right. because that abuse of power can really affect a demographic and be harmful. You may not know because what you might intend might be really beautiful or gorgeous or, you know, just have a, you know, just depending on your skill set. But just to kind of be mindful is that, you know, every a designer brings everything to life. And just like what you're saying, like the visual sovereignty, the way we know about things is through media. And I am I am educating people that are going to go out and create media. And I feel like it is my it is my duty in order to inform and keep myself also reminded like there are things I'm ignorant of and I am not the expert in the room in this and I need to um, you know impart that knowledge onto my students too it's not just about humility but it is about seeking that knowledge out we've been talking about what a highly visual culture we live in and with and social media tools like Instagram right have amplified that even further kind of really shaping what we know how what, how we know it like through visual media how do you see social media technologies and aesthetics affecting the practice of graphic design Sadie oh <laughs> so social media is an interesting tool I will say of the invention, it has done wonders for visibility has done wonders for sharing awareness. Any, anybody can get lost in TikTok. Anybody can get lost in, in Instagram hashtags. But it's really hard to protocol. A few things or my thoughts and feelings kind of around social media and, and just a means of amplifying indigenous voices. It's done wonders for artists, particularly fashion design. Nowadays, anybody can go through and kind of see, you know, what other people are wearing, what they're shopping, what, what it was trending, to say, what, to say the least. I will say that social media has done wonders for exposure, particularly to for artists and fashion designers and just being able to just sit somewhere and just kind of phone face and kind of scroll through and be able to see what has been nice to see indigenous creatives is take advantage of that. The downside of a lot of that exposure is there's not enough protocoling. There's not enough security to stop exploitation. You see that at a mass level because the meta universe or because the internet or just because what, we're, what, we, what we can all see through some of our social networks within Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok, you can't see what everyone else is doing. So let me give an example to, uh, to share what I mean. So I've done pieces for Indigenous Peoples Day. I've seen people take some of my graphics, manipulate them, and sell them for another cause or just because they just wanted something that looked indigenous and maybe they threw my design on a Native American Heritage Month flyer without asking that permission. But you can do that. Anybody can screenshot. Nowadays, anyone can throw a filter on that has any type of manipulation. We see we can do a facial recognition. So even that scare of technology, which is so easy, the user experience on social media is providing some of those scary aspects within technology. It's like a love-hate relationship. I really love because I get to see when I can't physically be in a space to see what other creatives are doing, get inspired and be able to support local. And even through a place like the pandemic has really had us utilize that space. But also there's a lot of fear in the exploitation aspect, which is very harmful, particularly coming from an identity and culture that it has a strong history of being exploited. So it's like, oh, like I wish wish we had a little bit more security in those aspects. But there are benefits of that technology. And I feel like we're still at the beginning point on how are we going to navigate through that? On the subject of the tyranny of the visual, I'm curious about especially with the history of graphic design, kind of corporate art, right? And I think when most people hear graphic design, they think about logos, right? And that is incredibly uh, effective, right? Most people can recognize more logos than they could current heads of state of sovereign nations around the world, right? Um, And so this relates to social media, it relates to what you're talking about, kind of moving away from that. But how are you thinking about counteracting 
not only the tyranny of the visual, but the way that so much of that is monopolized by kind of major corporations. And are there particular strategies or approaches you're taking yourself or encouraging your students to take to use graphic design in different ways? I think it probably started in the 90s, and then uh, certainly because of social media, we have much more visually literate and media literacy in younger and younger folks. And there is this idea of trust, whereas, you know, maybe the brands of, say, my parents who are, you know, from the boomer generation, they may have this like brand trust. There, there was this strategy in branding to build trust with your customers, right? And then you you just buy that, or you keep buying that brand because you know it works well, and you've harnessed design in order to create the community. But then, because the product worked well, people do continue to buy it. But you know, starting in the '90s and then and moving forward, we have this rise in in understanding the the actual goals of those brands are not necessarily to get your clothes clean or whatever it is to make money and and to build power and then ultimately political power. And then how do those companies then utilize the capital from not paying their employees or, or, or outsourcing labor in order to curry favor with elected officials? And so there becomes this awareness about what's actually going on behind maybe, you know, your favorite brand of shoes. And of course, social media helps us to understand that a bit more so there is this certain level of sophistication with with again younger and younger folks to be able to recognize that there is there are ulterior motives here and I just think that those things are always going to be there I think certain numbers of my students are like no I want to go and I want to design for these companies and I want to have a good job and I want to be able to support my family and I want to be able to you know have a have a home and and I I don't fault any of them for that I, you know, I, I, th- there is dignity in all work. But for me, I think that there is this potential to create the community in the future and the culture that we want if we interrogate those structures a bit more because we have so much power as makers of media. And again, I, I see that that's where my, um, my duty lies as an educator, that there are, there are multiple paths that you can take. Thank you both so much for joining me today. It's been a pleasure to talk with you. Listeners can keep up with ICS Happenings by following us on our Twitter and Instagram at ICSBGSU or on our Facebook page. You can listen to Big Ideas wherever you find your favorite podcasts. Please help us out by subscribing and rating us on your preferred platform. To suggest a topic for a future episode, you can visit us at bgsu.edu forward slash BG Ideas. Our sound engineers for this episode were Ryan Turner and Marco Mendoza with audio editing by Deanna McKeegan and Marco Mendoza. Research was provided by Sophia Mikulski with editing by Joe Elia.